Hey guys, Chef Hawks here again, and so now we are on chapter number eight, the safe flow of food. So now let's take a look because this is all about where we're going to be taking foods from that back door of the kitchen. And as you can see in the picture right here, you can see you've got a delivery guy who's uh, wanting to drop off product. And we are, it, it's all about us being in control of exactly how we're going to make sure that it gets from that back door, from that delivery guy, all the way through to your restaurant, making sure that every step of the way we're paying attention to any possible critical points where there could be some danger for that food. So let's get, let's get right into it. So something we already briefly talked about was cross-contamination. So this is when we have pathogens that spread from one surface to another. So as you can see right in the picture here, perfect example. We have some raw chicken, maybe infected with salmonella, and we're slicing up some iceberg lettuce right next to it, uh, which is a ready-to-eat food, RTE food. And so as we know, ready-to-eat foods will no longer be processed in some sort of way like heat, uh, heat treatment, like cooking, to kill off that bacteria. And so that's where those foods are especially um, in danger of being cross-contaminated. So we have to know how to prevent that type of thing from happening. Uh, we have to separate raw foods and ready-to-eat foods uh, when they're being stored and when they're being processed and when they're being, um, when they're being uh, prepared for different dishes as well. We have to make sure that when we're cleaning and sanitizing that we're doing it effectively to stop that from happening even in between uses. Um, we're prepping food at different times. So again, with this example right here, we wouldn't be doing both of these simultaneously on the same board. And we're always storing chemically separately, chemicals separately as well, because chemicals uh, can cause that cross-contamination as well. So a very big point that we've looked at from day one is the is the temperature danger zone. So time and temperature abuse are the things that are the most controllable for us as culinarians. We can't control exactly how much acidity is in a food uh, when it's pulled off the vine. We can't control um, uh, a lot of the other things like whether it has protein or sugars in it because these naturally occur in most foods that we don't have that control factor. But the two things we always have control over is time and temperature. So we must ensure that there is no time and temperature abuse happening. So the temperature danger zone. So this is where it goes from 41 Fahrenheit to 135 Fahrenheit. So this is the area where bacteria are growing and they're growing quite well. They're very happily in there. Now a smaller temperature zone right here from 70, which is right around room temperature, up to 125 Fahrenheit, which uh, that's a very hot day in Death Valley. Um, right in this area here, that's where these pathogens, the, these bacteria, can grow rapidly. Um, and they can grow out of control. So, now if you think about it, these, uh, these pathogens are not that dissimilar from us. Um, if it's cold, if we're in refrigeration temperatures, we want to have a coat on. Uh, we generally want to be at home. We want to be protected from that type of temperature. Um, or if we are, if it's extremely hot, we don't want to be in that temperature because it would it would hurt us, it would damage us. But the, man, these pathogens are exactly the same as us. Between 70 and 125, they're going crazy. They love it. It's like a nice warm day for them. But remember, the temperature danger zone, 41 to 135. Bacteria can be quite happy in, in that full range. So we need to be able to reduce the time that food is in that temperature danger zone. If food is left out for longer than four hours in that temperature danger zone, it's got to go. So when we're cooking, uh, cooking different products, are they being cooked at the wrong temperature? We must make sure that we achieve uh, the, the minimum temperature, the minimum internal temperature. Um, and we're going to go more into that later on. But this is critical for certain specific foods. We want to maintain the quality of the food, so we don't want to overcook some foods. But there are certain temperature uh, temperature levels that we must get to in order to restrict bacterial growth or preferably kill all the bacteria off that we possibly can. If food is held at the wrong temperature, then this is a problem too. And this is whether we're holding the food at cold temperatures. If it's above 41, if our temperature in our refrigerator is at 45, well, that's still cold, but it's not cold enough. It must be 41 and below. If it's being uh, if it's being kept too uh, too warm 
but not hot enough. So 135 being the temperature, the top of the temperature danger zone. If the food is kept at 130, then the bacteria are enjoying themselves. Again, we have to make sure we're keeping it above 135. Uh, now we also have issues of quality control there, though. If we keep that food too hot for too long, the food will dry out. So there's a balance. We have to also make sure that whether we are cooling food or reheating food, that we do it correctly too, because otherwise we can end up uh, keeping that food in the temperature danger zone for too long. We're going to get more into that later as well. Let's take a look at how we control that temperature. How do we know when we're at the right temperatures? So one of the most popular things in the industry is a bimetallic stemmed thermometer. This is what you can see right here. And so as you can see, from top to bottom, you have the indicator head right at the top, and this has the either degrees Fahrenheit or degrees Celsius uh, measured right across here, and the needle moves in the direction of hotter or colder. And so then you also have an indicator nut at the top here. We're going to take a look at a quick video in just a moment uh, that will actually show you exactly what that's for. This is the stem running straight down here. And when you see this dimple, it's just this little pockmark right in, uh, in this area here. Um, so this is the area which is sensing the temperature of the food you're placing in. So notice, if you just have just this, uh, just this tip in here, that will quite possibly not get an accurate read on the temperature that we're looking for. So always make sure that we're using as much of that space there as we possibly can to get a good accurate reading on our temperatures. So we're supposed to insert the stem to the dimple. Uh, that's the sensing area, like we said. Um, whether it's uh, thick or, or large foods, uh, you want to make sure you get into the thickest area. So if you have a whole tenderloin, uh, so I believe this is a pork tenderloin we have here, we want to get right up at the head end here so that we're making sure that we're getting the thickest area because that's going to take the longest to cook. So that's where we need to make sure that core internal temperature has reached the appropriate temperature. And so we would generally take two readings on a larger piece like this as well, just because we need to make sure um, that we're getting an accurate read on there. And when we're taking temperatures with bimetallic uh, thermometers, we're taking it for about 15 seconds. This is because it can literally take that long for that dial to get to where it's going to eventually read. So we can calibrate these, because if these thermometers are dropped or, or banged or uh, put under extreme temperatures, they can get out of calibration. So there is a method here. So let's take a quick look at a video that I have of that method. How to calibrate a bimetallic stem thermometer. Fill a large container with crushed ice. Add tap water until the container is full. Put the thermometer stem into the ice water. Make sure the sensing area is under the water, but not touching the bottom of the container. Wait 30 seconds or until the indicator stops moving. And rotate the thermometer head until it reads 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius. How to calibrate a bimetallic stem thermometer. So bimetallic thermometers are reasonably accurate to within a couple of degrees. Um, but as we could see in there, it's pretty easy to recalibrate them uh, using that ice point method where you're putting the ice water um, and you're, put, you're putting the, uh, the bimetallic strip straight down into that freezing water. Just be careful um, that not to put anything like salt in there that can alter that freezing point of that water to give an inaccurate reading. You can also place uh, the bimetallic thermometer into boiling water. Um, the only thing is, whilst uh, this is another accurate way of uh, recalibrating your thermometer, this can be more dangerous for obvious reasons. You're having to hold a thermometer over boiling water, whereas ice water isn't going to really hurt anybody. So in our kitchen, uh, we also have bimetallic thermometers, but we have digital thermometers as well. They tend to be more accurate and faster as well um, at getting the readings. The critical thing that we need to always have, no matter what type of thermometer you're using, 
it must be cleaned and sanitized regularly after each time you use it and make sure that, that storage case they normally have a small tube thermometer case uh, that you can slip them in make sure that you keep all of those clean because we don't want that to be the purpose for cross contamination one way that we can make sure that the safe flow of uh, food is coming into our back door um, in a safe fashion is we're purchasing from reputable suppliers so this is critical for us because if you were to purchase foods from a supplier who just happened to knock on the back door hey I've got some uh, cheap steaks going do you want to purchase these for your restaurant if you don't know where they're from and how they've been treated and if you don't have the reassurances and guarantees that a reputable supplier will give you then it's not worth the risk of your restaurant to do something like that so we always purchase from approved reputable suppliers and um, we always uh, go to inspect inspected food sources uh, because the fact is if you go to a US food service or a riches or any of these large distribution companies or even if you go to Walmart or Sam's Club or, or Target or anywhere like this they have specific inspection points all the way along their uh, their cycle of uh, producing food to make sure that their food is as, as clean and as safe as we can possibly have it um, all of these suppliers have uh, have things in their supply chain uh, so that they have safety practices between the growers and the distributors so we must make sure as managers because that's what we're looking at being in this in this course is that we are training staff to make sure that we are ensuring the food that comes in the door is being received appropriately that it's being inspected is it the correct food is there the correct amount is it the safest it can be is it the right temperatures are the containers sealed um, are they exactly the way they should be and is it then stored immediately in the correct fashion um, we have to make sure that we're inspecting carefully and immediately we're not just having the food dropped off at the back door in the middle of lunch service to then sit out for two hours before we actually get to it um, so we need to make sure it gets put away quickly stored in correct containers and in, in the correct order we're going to talk about first in first out FIFO um, and the method that we use in that later on as well so we have to make sure that we can uh, accept uh, or reject certain products and so even an employee who may not be a supervisor should be empowered to be able to reject that food if it's not safe and appropriate for what we're looking for and of the quality we're looking for so there are certain products uh, like you can see over here and uh, with these chicken breasts we can actually insert the thermometer directly into it into the thickest part to make sure that it's the correct temperature when we're receiving it should be 41 or below to make sure that it's uh, outside of the temperature danger zone there may be other products like this uh, is ground beef which is frozen and so we can't actually get a thermometer into this meat because it's frozen solid but if we put it in between then we should be able to get an accurate reading um, on these types of packages if we have uh, some things like this uh, this creme fraiche we may be able to open the product to get an accurate reading from it So when we have cold temperature, time and temperature controlled for safety foods, remember TCS, time and temperature controlled for safety foods. Uh, those are the types of foods that are the high risk foods uh, that we identified last time. So that's where we're looking at uh, things like dairy products, we're looking at meats, we're looking at things like tomatoes, anything which has protein and or carbohydrates, uh, sugars of some sort, that would feed the bacteria that would love that food um, we have to make sure that time and temperature are, are the key things that we control so if it's cold it's got to be 41 or lower if it's hot then it's got to be 135 or higher frozen foods should be frozen solid frozen solid generally means right around zero degrees or colder so we reject foods that have ice crystals so you can see right over here uh, these shrimp over here are coated in ice crystals these ones here are not generally when things like this are, are frozen they're quick frozen they're IQF individually quick frozen so these are actually frozen with liquid nitrogen so they don't get frostbite on them or anything like that um, when they are possibly accidentally defrost and refrozen that's when these large ice crystals can form on them 
And this is an indication that we may have a problem because if they were defrosted during the delivery process or during some, st some stage from when they were harvested all the way through to our kitchen door, then they may have been defrosted for a significant length of time and could be dangerous. So we reject anything that's along those lines. So with cans, we can see right here, we've got a big old dent in this can. Uh, the, we've got a bad ripple across here. There could even be um, some opening here uh, where the can may no longer be properly sealed. So if you have something that's dented, rusty, bulging, bulging can indicate that maybe there's a damage in the seal and there's fermentation going on to where that's, um, that's now uh, open to the world and there's bacteria growing and thriving in there. Um, if the packaging has tears, holes, or punctures, or leaks, leaks or any kind of dampness, uh, any kind of water stains, or any kind of pest damage, um, and, and especially if there's expiration dates which are over, then we cannot accept any of those food items. So we are going to go into inspection stamps more uh, at later uh, chapters, but for right now, just be aware that we have inspection stamps right here you can see um, that on certain different foods, so meat, poultry, and eggs, um, they are uh, all inspected by the USDA. Um, and so we have to make sure, and then we have the State Department of Agriculture as well, uh, we have to make sure that we're always keeping an eye out for those types of stamps because that is a, is a reassurance that it has met the safety standards uh, which we're looking for to keep our food safe. So if we are seeing any mold or abnormal colors, Take a look at this cheese. Would you accept this? Of course not. It's covered in mold and it's not supposed to be blue cheese. If it's slimy, sticky, or dry in texture, uh, or if there's flesh, um, if it's, say, chicken or beef, and it's kind of soft, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, press back when, uh, when you're pressing down on it, uh, then there could be some deterioration in quality there as well. Or if there's any abnormal and unpleasant odors. Most foods don't have a very sharp, unpleasant odor. Um, so if you smell something unusual, there's probably something wrong. So shellfish, things like oysters, mussels, clams, and scallops, um, we, are, we permit them, if they're live, to come in and have an air temperature around them of 45 degrees. Uh, the internal temperature can go up to about 50, but when we receive them, within four hours, we want them to be down to 41 degrees. And that's relatively simple, as long as they go straight into our refrigerator, that works at or below 41 degrees. So if we have shucked shellfish, and so the difference here, if you didn't already know, shucked shellfish is when they have been removed from their shells. So this indicates that they are dead and they are no longer alive, so they must be kept um, and under more stringent temperatures. So oysters, mussels, clams, and scallops that have already been shucked, removed from their shells, they can arrive at 45 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. We again have four hours to get them below 41 degrees um, as quickly as we can. When you purchase shellfish, they come with identification tags. Uh, so those live, live shellfish will have a, have a small tag that comes with them that gives the information specific to where they were, where they were um, harvested from and the dates on them as well. So we must make sure that we hold on to those for 90 days. The chef will keep a file um, on all of the shellfish that was purchased, and they write down on that tag the date when the last shellfish in that batch uh, was served. And so you actually then take it, put it into a file, keep it in your office uh, for the next 90 days, because it can take a fairly significant length of time for some illnesses from shellfish to emerge. So if you have shellfish which are very muddy, if they have broken shells, then that will mean that they're dead. Or if, if you're actually seeing lots of shells when they're, when they're still you know, pre-cooking, if their shells are open, that indicates that they are already dead. You don't want to be receiving those because you won't be able to use them. You'll just be wasting your money on a significant amount of, de of dead product. So when it comes to eggs, so eggs should be clean and unbroken. As long as that shell is whole around the egg, um, then uh, various different bacteria um, can't get in there. But if you have uh, if you have eggs which are broken, then it's an open container. It's just like having a can that's been uh, damaged in some sort of way. Bacteria can now get in there and thrive. 
they should be maintained at 45 or they should be received at 45 or lower um, according to USDA uh, grading standards and so you can see we have uh, this is the grading standard that we'll be looking for right here um, and then um, if you purchase liquid frozen or dehydrated egg products um, those are generally pasteurized and so those are USD, USDA inspection uh, graded and so that's where you actually will uh, will have more of a reassurance of less pathogenic growth. So we can use uh, things like this, say if we're getting uh, liquid egg whites uh, that are in a carton that have been pasteurized, we can use those in, uh, in certain types of icing, knowing that because they've been pasteurized, the bacteria have been killed off um, to an extent that we will be able to use it without having to cook it, because you can't cook an icing. And then we have milk. So when milk is delivered, we can receive it at 45 Fahrenheit or lower. But within four hours, again, we've got to get that down to uh, the temperature in the refrigerator, 41 or below. Um, milks are pasteurized. Um, in fact, you have to have a special license, and it's very difficult to have any unpasteurized milk. Um, as good as it tastes, the safety factor, factor is more important uh, to the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, uh, that grades the quality um, of our milk. And we'll be looking for a grade A milk um, when we're purchasing it for our restaurant. So as we mentioned, TCS foods, time and temperature controlled for safety foods, those high risk foods. So we want to make sure they are kept at 41 degrees or lower when we, when we are looking at cold temperature holding or if it's hot holding where we're keeping them um, at a hot serving temperature, then 135 Fahrenheit or above is where we need to keep it. We always have to monitor those temperatures as well. Say, say if we have it on a buffet, now, we need to make sure if we have them in a chafing dish or under a heat lamp that we have to make sure that those are sufficient enough that they are maintaining that temperature above 135. If not, then we need to uh, we need to be changing that food out. So we should always be labeling our TCS foods, our time and temperature control for safety foods. So any foods that we're prepping up in-house um, and holding for more than 24 hours uh, should be labeled. Now. I personally, and the standard we have in our kitchen, is that whatever food goes into that refrigerator, it's wrapped um, correctly, just like you can see in this picture right here. And we're putting the name of what it is and the date on there as well. Um, that's my standard for my kitchen, but officially it must be labeled with if it's going to be held for more than 24 hours. Um, labeling includes the name of the food and the date that it um, that it needs to be sold, eaten, or thrown out. Um, so, well, how long is that? Well, for TCS foods, it should be that you can store it for seven days or less at 41 Fahrenheit, so uh, refrigerated temperatures or lower, and on the seventh day you throw it out. Now, just to just to concrete this for you, the day that you wrap this food up is day one. So it's not seven days after you produce that food. It's seven days including the day that you produce that food. Always make sure that you rotate your food. You want to make sure that you have the oldest food is used up first. So this is first in, first out, FIFO. So it's really important with a FIFO method that we're making sure that, uh, say if you get a delivery of, uh, of new yogurt coming in, that you actually pull forward the older yogurt batch and put the new yogurt behind it. Um, this is critical and this is something that comes into training your staff to make sure that they're always doing this because if they were to place that new yogurt right in front then naturally when people go into that refrigerator to grab, uh, to grab a product they're always going to grab the ones at the front. If the one behind is older then by the time you get all the way through you're probably going to end up with a lot of food spoilage or possibility of food poisoning because you've got foods which have been sitting for too long at the back of the refrigerator. So we need to make sure we prevent cross-contamination um, during our storage uh, uh, systems that we have. So we must make sure that we cover and wrap our foods tightly, whether we're putting them into a container or just cling wrapping them. Um, make sure that you separate raw and ready-to-eat foods out. Uh, ready to eat foods should always go above anything that's raw. And so we're going to look at some specifics on this uh, so that you can understand how this all works. 
But this really all comes down to the fact that we want to make sure that no raw juices are ever going to drip onto ready-to-eat foods because ready-to-eat foods will not be cooked um, or, or processed in any kind of way to kill that bacteria off before the person goes to eat it. So let's take a look at how this system works. And we've got a picture right here to indicate exactly how we, were, how we would stack a refrigerator. If you can't completely separate these out, then this is, how, this is how we would stack the different layers. So up at the top, ready to eat foods. So we have our lettuces right here. We're not going to cook that iceberg lettuce before we put it um, right next to a cooked burger or into a salad. Um, we're going to have this completely raw. Next one down is seafood. Um, so seafood is generally seen as being a lower risk um, uh, kind of a product. Um, but we always, again, want to make sure that you're wrapping that really well so that it won't, preferably won't drip down onto anything else. Next on the, on the way down is whole cuts of beef and pork and steaks, things like that. They will go in the next layer. They are relatively low in risk. As we go farther down, we're going to go with ground meats and ground fish. So the reason why ground meat and ground fish is a higher risk is because generally, if you take a look at this uh, large piece of meat here, if there are bacteria in here, which of course there are, there's bacteria on everything, but the fact is the bacteria is on the outside of this piece of meat because in, uh, it, it's not going to be inside it because that piece of meat is a solid piece of meat. So as we go to cook it, when we sear this meat off, it's going to kill the bacteria that are present on the outside very rapidly. So we're reassured of the fact that the bacterial levels um, on this food have been taken care of very quickly. However, when you take that piece of meat and you grind it up, you're taking the bacteria that were on the outside of this meat, and it's now inside the meat. And so that's why ground meats and ground fish are a much higher risk product. Um, and we should always, oops, we should always treat them um, uh, with a lot more care when we're working with them. So then on to our higher, highest risk food. And that's our poultry. So that's when we're going to be using things like chicken um, and turkeys. We have to be extremely careful with them. They tend to have a much higher risk factor when it comes to bacterial uh, growth um, and infection. So we have to make sure that we keep those down at the bottom. Um, we actually will cook the chicken to the highest internal temperature um, out of all of those products and so as you can see on here this is all based on minimum internal temperatures we have to cook the chicken to the highest temperature so if we were to splash or drip any juices from anything that's above onto that chicken it will receive the highest temperature um, points at, during cooking out of any other food so there is a, there is a probability that we would still kill any bacteria that would be um, cross-contaminated from other foods on something like chicken. So we always have to make sure in our storage that we're not overloading coolers and freezers. We must make sure we always have good airflow. Uh, when you take a look at your refrigerator at home, uh, the shelves may be made of glass. They may be completely solid. Um, well, a refrigerator at home is made for only opening a few times a day, whereas a refrigerator in a commercial kitchen is made to be opened dozens of times every hour, um, but they can recover much, much quicker. That's why they have much bigger fans in them that circulate the air um, very, very quickly, um, and they can also recover that temperature much, much quicker because they're designed to be able to counteract the effects of service time when you have all of that movement going on. But if you were to, uh, to do something that would prevent good airflow in your fridge or freezer, so if you were to uh, place down a lot of uh, trays, or if you were to try and uh, wrap the shelves for some reason, maybe to keep them clean so that you don't have to clean them as frequently, this is a bad practice. You want there to be as much airflow as possible to keep that food um, as cool as possible at all times. It can actually put a lot more, uh, if you're breaking that, uh, that airflow movement, it can actually um, put more stress on the compressor um, and uh, and the, uh, the systems in that fridge or freezer as well. And so that can end up being more maintenance that you have to pay for as well. So we have to make sure overall that we don't have any time and temperature abuse going on uh, when we're working with preparation as well. So 
Um, we only remove from the refrigerator as much food as we need at any given time, just so that, that way we're making sure um, that uh, no food is just sitting out for significant lengths of time and deteriorating in quality and also deteriorating in the amount of bacterial growth that we may have going on. So we always prepare things in small batches. Say if I needed to um, fabricate 12 chickens, I'm not going to take all 12 chickens out simultaneously and have them all sit out while I prepare them one at a time and then put them all back in the refrigerator two hours later when I get them finished. That's completely unacceptable and dangerous. We would just take them out one at a time um, and as we're breaking them down then they, they, the pieces can go back in the refrigerator. Uh, it may be slightly less, um, uh, slightly less e economical with your time, uh, but the factor of uh, keeping that food safe is a lot more important. But when it comes to thawing, we have a few different methods that we can use, uh, some better than others, uh, but uh, we have a few different um, methods which are permitted when it comes to doing this. We never want our foods to hit room temperature. And that's the key component to how we make sure that we defrost things in a safe manner. So because freezing does not kill bacteria, um, it, uh, it just makes them go inactive. This is why we have to make sure that we keep these foods at a safe temperature. So the best method, number one method for the, both the quality of the food and also for the, um, for the, Maintenance of not having um, overrun with bacteria is to just literally place those foods into a cooler, into the refrigerator, until they're fully defrosted. Now, what happens if you have a turkey and it's the day before Thanksgiving and you've got a 20 pound turkey? Um, there's no way that it's going to defrost in a refrigerator because that may take three or four days to uh, defrost in a refrigerator. What are you going to do? Okay, well, we have some other methods. So as you can see in the second picture right here, this is the submerging method. So we can submerge the uh, that chicken that we've got right here, or the turkey, whatever else it is you might be wanting to defrost. You can submerge it fully under cold running water. So now that cold running water isn't just pouring gallons of water away every minute. You're literally talking about a trickle, a gentle trickle of water coming down. So that, that uh, water is normally around about room temperature, about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it should be potable water. What is potable water? That is drinking water. You cannot be using a source of water that could contaminate the, uh, the TCS food. Um, never let that food get above 41 Fahrenheit. So what will actually happen in here? Because this is frozen. The water that's pouring on here is pouring onto something that's probably around zero degrees Fahrenheit to start off with. And so as this defrosts, it will actually keep that water very cold. Um, so that's, a, that's an okay method. Again, it's quicker than just putting it into the refrigerator, uh, but it still does maintain the quality of the food um, to a pretty good extent. So then what do we do if, uh, if we need something that's even quicker than that? We can use a microwave. However, the problem with a microwave is microwaves very unevenly uh, process foods, whether you're defrosting or cooking. Um, if you place that, um, place that piece of chicken into a microwave, you may find that the small thin ends of that chicken actually start to cook before the rest of it has fully defrosted. And when you have a piece of chicken that's already cooked before another piece is already defrosted, you're going to find uneven cooking. You're going to find that some of that chicken is going to go kind of tough and rubbery. Um, so it's not the best method. It's okay in an emergency. Or the last method is that you can be part of the cooking process. So say if you literally have a whole chicken um, and it's frozen and you need to cook it as quickly as you can and you don't have time to defrost it, technically you can place it directly into the oven. Obviously make sure you unwrap it. Um, and take out any uh, kind of plastic bag that may be inside uh, with any of the um, with any of the uh, internal organs that may be stored inside the uh, cavity. But you can cook it from frozen. And uh, now, and in terms of quality of the finished product, it's probably going to be fairly low because by the time you get that um, minimum internal temperature for something like chicken is 165 Fahrenheit. The outside and the wings and certain parts will probably be quite ruined by that stage. But in a pinch, it is a cooking or it is a 
defrosting method that you can use. So when we cook our foods, um, it's uh, this is critical for when we're creating safe foods. Um, we have to make sure that we're hitting the right temperature to kill the bacteria that's associated with that food product. Um, so there are specific amounts of time um, that we're allowed to have that food cooking um, in terms of we must uh, try and cook food as quickly as possible um, and chill it down as quickly as possible to keep it out of the temperature danger zone. Uh, whilst maintaining quality of that food too. Always remembering, we have those high-risk populations, so we have the very young, we have the very old, and then we have the immune-suppressed um, individuals as well. So we have to make sure that for thing, things like them, we have to make sure that we're not using uh, raw seed sprouts, we're not using um, any raw or undercooked eggs, meats, or seafoods, um, because they're at higher risk uh, than the rest of the general population. So let's now take a look at a few of these temperatures that we must achieve. So when it comes to that chicken, like we said, and so we're looking at this in the same way we look at our refrigerator. So chicken must be cooked to a minimum internal temperature. So that's at the very, at the very center. We'd take the thickest part, maybe around here. There might be the thickest part of that chicken breast, and we're going to check it there for 15 seconds. Remember that bimetallic thermometer is going to take about that long just to give us an accurate reading. Um, we're going to make sure it hits 165 um, so that we've killed off all the bacteria that could be in there. So then we've got the next level down. That's where we have ground meats. And so that would include things like burgers. Um, that uh, We must make sure that, that ground meat that was going on that, ne that next shelf up right above uh, the poultry, that that's cooked to 155. And again, we're measuring it for 15 seconds. And then we're looking at things like fish. So they have to be cooked to a minimum internal temperature of 145 for 15 seconds. Again, uh, so these are all of the various different types of shellfish. And then when we're looking at last, uh, large roasts, things like pork, pork, beef, veal, and lamb, uh, they must be cooked to a minimum internal temperature of 145 for at least four minutes. So why are we checking that for longer? Well. And this, for this, you would probably take at least a couple of different checks. It's going to take a while to make sure that we are checking and actually getting an accurate reading um, on such a large piece of meat here as well. And then when we're looking at commercially processed, ready-to-eat foods um, that are going to be um, hot-held hot for service. So you've got things like these mozzarella sticks. So these mozzarella sticks are relatively low um, in, on the safety uh, factor purely because they've been commercially processed. There's probably been a lot of safeguards involved in producing them already to where they are. Um, and so they have to hit 135 Fahrenheit. Um, that's the top of the temperature danger zone. And then things like fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes, um, that will be hot held for service, we must hit 135 for them as well. So again, when we're looking at holding food, if we are going for hot holding, 135 or above, cold holding, 41 or below, when we're putting it into that refrigerator, we want to check temperatures for every four hours, say if they're on a buffet or something like that, and they're being maintained at that temperature, we're going to check them at least every four hours to make sure that the quality and temperature is holding. Um, I would also, I would generally recommend doing it more often than that. Um, just because you never know um, what could be happening during that time as well. Uh, but do not reheat um, in hot holding equipment. This is critical. So if you have a hot box of some sort, we have one of those in our kitchen, or if you have a chafing dish, they are only made to hold food at 135 or above. That's why they're not called cooking equipment. They are called hot holding equipment. They are not made for cooking or for reheating foods, they will do it too slowly to where they will hold that food in the temperature danger zone for too long. All right, so what do we do now if we're going to cool that food down? Say we've just made a, a large pot of chili and we want to cool it down. So there are some critical things that we must take care of during this process. So when we're boiling it, we're at right around 212, so it's good and hot. Kill all, killing uh, a load of the bacteria off in there, um, we, you know, we are looking good. Now, we still have that temperature danger zone because 
there's there's bacteria everywhere in our world and so that food can become reinfected or you may have a spore forming bacteria that comes right back to life and as it passes back down through that temperature danger zone we have to make sure that it goes as rapidly as possible so some critical things for you to remember so once we hit 135 so the foods come from 212 it's reduced down to 135 we are now in the temperature danger zone so the most critical part of that temperature danger zone going from 135 down to 70 that's where it's nice and warm the bacteria are bathing in a warm stew with all of the protein that they need um, and they've got all of the temperature which is keeping them nice and comfortable we want to reduce it down to 70 degrees that's right around room temperature within two hours that's a critical time and um, we're going to show you a few ways that we actually can achieve that quite easily without you know, very expensive pieces of equipment um, but this is really critical once we hit 70 now we have to get it down to 41 or below remember 41 is the bottom of the temperature danger zone that's our refrigerator temperature so for those that last bit of temperature from 70 to 41 and um, we have four more hours to get that done but please don't just be thinking i've got six total hours to do this because this is critical you have two hours to get to 70 then you have four hours to get to 41 something that's critical that we must make sure that we uh, achieve if we do not then the one thing we can do is we can reheat that product and then try to chill it back down again um, so say if it's chilly you can reheat that bring it right back up to the boil again and then reduce it down uh, and get it down quicker this time the problem is is that if you uh, have to repeat this then the quality of what you're producing is probably going to go down um, at the same time as the risk factor so always pay attention to getting foods chilled down as quickly as possible so how do we do that well we can reduce the size of the product so if we have that chili if we're making 50 pounds of chili if you just leave that in the pot that we cooked it in um, and, and hope that it cools down it's not going to it's way too big of a mass a solid mass to cool down rapidly you can pour it into smaller containers you can pour it into shallow containers um, so you give it a larger surface area so that it can have that um, have the heat drawn off it much much quicker um, you can also as you can see right back here this is going into a water bath that water bath uh, and the ice rather that's in there will actually cool this down very very quickly just make sure you stir it so the internal part of that product cools down rapidly as well so not only using an ice bath to do it you can also use an ice paddle you can purchase uh, these products here it's a plastic product where it's filled with water inside that you put in the freezer and so this is now very very cold and you literally just use this just to stir that soup or that chili um, to cool that temperature down really quickly or you could create a food which is quite concentrated and you can add add ice as the as part of an ingredient just beware if you were to try and do that say with chili if you were to just add a bunch of ice into the chili you may end up making a very watery chili so you may actually damage the quality of the food you're doing uh, the last thing we've got on here is a blast chiller this is basically a large uh, refrigerator uh, looking piece of equipment uh, which has a high intensity fan system that blasts very very cold air at huge volumes this can cool food down very very quickly it also costs a lot of money so a lot of operations can't afford to have one and it also takes up a fairly uh, significant amount of space uh, that a lot of restaurants just don't have that room in their in their kitchen to be able to dedicate for that kind of piece of equipment but as we can see there are plenty of other options that are very very adequate to get this uh, get this job done so when we're reheating so we, we want to reheat any product um, up to the correct temperature we want to uh, we want to make sure that we're cooking it and cooling it correctly and appropriately so when we're hot holding um, TCS foods we must bring them up to 165 and again we're measuring it for 15 seconds just to make sure we're getting that accurate reading and you want to have that heated up within two hours so ready to eat foods these are the foods which are now cooked finished ready to go 
they're not going to be getting any more um, heat um, heat put through to them. Uh, they are ready to be consumed. We always must make sure that we're using some kind of a barrier between us and those foods. So using things like tongs, deli sheets, uh, or gloves, so that we protect that food. Uh, always make sure that you have separate utensils for each item, just in case if there's some kind of a problem with one item that you may not be able to see, uh, but you don't want to be cross-contaminating between them. Uh, make sure that you have uh, clean and sanitized areas that you're keeping them in, um, and also make sure that um, the, uh, the handle extends above the rim. So as you can see, I've got this ladle right here that's going over the top. The handle of these tongs are over the top. These are all outside um, of, the, of the edge of these foods so that they're not going to be contaminated as they're being used. So some ways of carrying plates, some important things here. You can see the thumb right here. Your thumb should not be on the plate. Um, this is for the food only. And so anytime you're, uh, you're doing um, service with your bare hands like this, you want to make sure that you're not coming into food contact areas. Just like this, where they're carrying it with no, uh, with no fingers or thumbs possibly contaminating that food. And we're looking at things like glassware. Glassware is a food uh, contact product. And so we need to make sure that people aren't carrying them like this where he's got his chin right here, he's got his hands right where the lips of the person who's drinking that next beverage may be going, and it's up against his apron, which hopefully that apron's clean, but it may not be because he probably was processing dirty dishes as well as taking clean dishes out. So it's important for things like glassware, we use racks. That way we're not touching them until we're actually producing the product that goes in them. When it comes to flatware, we make sure we're not touching the part that is going to be used to consume the actual food. We hold on to the handle itself um, and make sure you have clean hands anytime you're handling those clean utensils. When it comes to any foods, um, ready to eat foods like this, we're never handling it with bare hands, either, either using tongs, a deli sheet, gloves, some sort of barrier to stop you from touching that food. When it comes to ice, I always tell my students, the only thing that ever goes into an ice machine is an ice scoop. Hands don't go in there, bottles don't go in there to cool down uh, your, your beverages, uh, nothing else can ever go in and touch that ice. The ice is technically counted as a food and should be treated as such. Um, we also must make sure that no glass ever gets close to that ice, because if you have an issue where that glass can shatter, all of that ice must now be drained off. You cannot use anything that may have any kind of risk to that ice. When we're looking at off-site delivery services, um, then you've got to make sure that we're keeping temperatures and that we have equipment that can keep the temperature up. Uh, we have some large Cambro products like this, um, which are well insulated and sealed on the doors, like you can see right here. Um, these are great because they insulate that food. As long as that food is, is hot going in, it will maintain it hot for a significant period of time. Uh, but as you can see here, we're taking temperature checks on it to make sure that it did uh, reach its, fi its final area at the correct temperature. Um, make sure that anything like vending machines, if they need to be chilled, that they're chilling to the right temperature. Making sure that all the time we are controlling time and temperature on all products. So we have things like insulated food containers, uh, checking the temperatures, making sure that the delivery truck is clean, making sure that the food is labeled appropriately um, so that we know the date and time that it must be used, and any instructions that need to be given for reheating it and serving it so that it's kept safe. Uh, make sure that you've got uh, the correct utilities to go with it as well, and storing all of that food separately so that you don't have any cross-contamination. So we should be looking at having a management control system for when we are uh, working with different food processes in our establishments. So a food management, uh, food safety management system is a group of procedures and practices that when they're all put together will prevent foodborne illnesses from occurring. It controls the risks and hazards. So this is where we have an active managerial control system where we're controlling the risks, we're being proactive, we're not waiting for problems to come up, 
We're actually looking for them and anticipating them before they come up to try and control them and stop them from happening. So how do we do this? Well, we have training programs for, uh, for all of our uh, employees that the managers make sure that, that they are appropriately being done so that every employee knows their role. Um, make sure that you have manager supervision going on so that we're not just hoping that people are doing the right job, that we have assurances that they are. And for every single process that we go through, we have SOPs, Standard Operating Procedures. This is where it could be something as simple as when we make an omelette, we keep the uh, cheese and the eggs and the peppers and the ham and bacon and anything else that you're going to use in the refrigerator until it's time to use it. You then take the eggs out, whisk, the, break the eggs with clean hands um, into a clean bowl, and then you whisk it with a clean fork, um, and then you bring out the other products. And so with clean hands, without cross-contaminating, um, you then go through the process of adding those products into the saucepan, uh, into the, into the uh, saute pan to actually make it and produce that product. So how do we do all these things? Well, this is where we create a HACCP plan. So this is a hazard analysis with critical control points. And so this is all about what we're going to do to have a system in place so that we anticipate problems that could be coming up and we take care of them before they happen. So this is what identifies major hazards. And we're talking about all the way from when that food was possibly picked or grown out in the field by the farmer all the way through to when it was uh, when it's produced and consumed by your consumer at the end of the line it helps to prevent eliminate or at the very least reduce possibilities of, of problems happening with those foods all along the way this was actually created um, by um, a grouping with nasa when they were first sending astronauts up into space because they needed to make sure that their astronauts would get safe food that they could take with them and that they wouldn't get sick um, at some stage while they were out in space where they couldn't be rescued and they could possibly uh, they could po possibly be lost in space if they weren't able to get back it's kind of an interesting story and we're going to take more of a look at this Whenever you think about HACCP, you hear the term HACCP all the time. And as I said in the introduction, HACCP is a acronym and it stands for Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Points. Those two parts, there's the first part of HACCP is really conducting a hazard analysis. In the hazard analysis, you're going to do a very detailed analysis of the entire food production system. And then the rest of the principles of HACCP, you're going to understand the critical points in the system to control the food safety hazards. Our objectives are to make the product as safe as possible and then to be able to provide the record keeping system to prove that that process was as safe as possible. HACCP is really a preventive measure and it's not a reactive measure. And what I mean by that is that we're going to anticipate problems that might happen and then put controls in place to prevent them from happening. Hopefully, you don't have to implement a HACCP plan in reaction to a recall or an outbreak that has, has been associated with your particular food product. You want to think about the process and prevent any hazards from happening. HACCP is designed to identify our hazards, establish controls, and monitor those controls over time. The three types of hazards that we're concerned about are biological, chemical, and physical. And we'll go through these in detail, but just to give you an overview, a biological hazards are usually the things that you think about whenever you think about a food making you sick. It might be something like salmonella, or E. coli, or something that causes a foodborne illness. So those are our biological hazards. Then we have our chemical hazards. Our chemical hazards are things like pesticide residue or antibiotic residue that might come from a food product. And last of all, we have our physical hazards. Physical hazards are things such as metal or plastic or something that gets in your food that if you bite down, you might break your teeth or it could cut your uh, throat if you swallow it. So those are actually physical things that get into your your food. So those are the three things that we are concerned about. 
Now, HACCP has been around for several years, and actually, it was developed for the space program. Back in 1959, Pillsbury, combined with the U.S. Army Nautic Laboratories and NASA, developed HACCP to provide safe food for astronauts in the space program. And the reason they did that was because whenever they started analyzing systems to provide astronauts with safe food, if you can imagine you don't want an astronaut to get sick in outer space and result in a mission where they couldn't get home, if someone's sick and cannot complete that mission, so they wanted the food to be safe. So they started thinking, well, we will test our food and see if it has a pathogen. But when you look at testing methods, you can only um, assure that the product is, be 99% sure that the product is safe or 98% uh, sure. And if you test all the product, then there's nothing left to eat. So they came up with the system to actually analyze the process and combine that with record keeping in order to have a safe food system. So that really shows you just how important a HACCP plan is. So this should all be a written plan. It's not just something that's uh, kind of guessed around and, well, you know, we'll figure this out as we go. This is something that um, operations, big and small, should all have a written plan as to exactly uh, how they're going to make all of this work. From your menu and all the products that you have in your establishment, um, how you're working with your guests, the equipment that you have, because uh, as we looked at, we don't necessarily have all of the most expensive equipment for cooling or for heating or for hot holding, but all of it must achieve the, uh, the standards of what we have to do to keep that food safe, the processes and the operations. Um, and where each uh, operation is completely unique, every, every plan must be unique to that operation. How do we work out exactly how that HACCP plan will work? Well, one of the easiest ways is to use a simple plan like I have right here, and they can be a lot more complex, but as to how we identify the, uh, the flow chart of where we get from the delivery all the way through to the front of house where we're serving that food. So as you can see, we start up at the, up at the top right up here. The food is delivered by the supplier. Um, so does it come directly from that supplier? Or do we go and pick it up, depending on, on how it works? But we must make sure, because already right here, there is a critical control point right here that we have to analyze. And that is, is the food that's delivered at the correct temperature, at the correct standard? Are the containers safe and sealed? Is it exactly the way it should be? If we're, um, if we're having it where we're purchasing it straight from the supplier, that could be Walmart or Sam's Club or anywhere like that, where we are picking it up, do we have the capability in our car or in our, in our uh, truck that we may have with the company to maintain that food at the appropriate temperature to keep it safe? So once it arrives and we've, we've analyzed that, yes, it's safe, then where's it going after that? Well, it could be that it's, served at, that it's st stored at room temperature in our dry storage. Um, and our dry storage has appropriate racking to keep uh, foods at least six inches off the floor so that uh, various different um, uh, bugs and rodents can't get to it. Or is it, so, is it stored in the refrigerator? Well, it's important that we make sure that, that refrigerator is 41 or below. Or is it frozen? In which case it needs to be at zero or below. So after that, say if we have that frozen food, say if we have some, uh, some hamburger patties that are stored in that freezer. Well, before we, uh, before we go to start cooking them, we're going to need to thaw that food. So it could be that uh, we thaw it and then we do some preparations on it. So it could just be uh, ground beef that's then thawed and then formed into burgers. Well, so af uh, after that, is it going to then be cooked? Um, or, or is it going to be uh, a certain food that might, may just be prepared? So you may have something like a salad, uh, which is uh, ready to eat foods. And so it's actually not going to be cooked. It's going to bypass this and be served immediately. If it does need to be cooked, then we cook it. And are we going to serve it immediately? Or is it going to be hot hold food where it may be on a buffet? Or do we cook that food, say the chili, and we need to cool it down because it's not going to be served until tomorrow? Then we have to make sure we cool the food. Every one of these arrows as we're going through is a critical control point that we have to make sure that, uh, that we are 
maintaining that food appropriately and storing that food appropriately and cooking food appropriately to the right temperatures with the right timing so that we keep our standards to where they need to be. Um, and then when we're serving the food, it's possible that there may be some leftovers um, that we may need to store them um, for, uh, for, uh, for further use after that. Again, another critical control point. So we must make sure all along the way that every step um, as we go through here is a critical control point. And so our HACCP plan is our hazard analysis of all of these critical control points. It is possible to keep food safe. It's done every day in the United States. But any one of these things that are broken will turn around and could possibly poison people. And that's what, we, uh, what we're always looking to avoid by doing it before time rather than allowing a poisoning to happen and then we have to correct the problem afterwards. Okay, so I hope you're able to follow along with everything on here. The safe flow of food is critical to everything that we do. We can have the finest restaurant in the United States, but if it's serving food which is not safe, then we won't be in business for long. Uh, so it's important that we all understand all of these things so that as we're working in the kitchen more and more, that we're able to do it effectively and safely um, so that we can uh, have safe food in our establishments and so that we live up to the name of our establishments. Please let me know if you have any questions. Um, I, we, this is definitely something that you need to understand fully um, and we can always cover anything that you need to know uh, with a little more detail. And I look forward to seeing you in the kitchen soon. Cheers.